Welcome to Free Thoughts, a podcast project of the Cato Institute's Libertarianism.org. Free Thoughts is a show about libertarianism and the ideas that influence it. I'm Aaron Powell, a research fellow here at Cato and editor of Libertarianism.org. And I'm Trevor Burris, a research fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Constitutional Studies. Our topic for today's episode is egalitarianism, and joining us to discuss it is Elizabeth Anderson. Professor Anderson is the Arthur F. Thurnau Professor and John Dewey Distinguished University Professor of Philosophy and Women's Studies at the University of Michigan. Welcome to Free Thoughts, Professor Anderson. Thank you. I I want to start with what I think a lot of libertarians, when they hear the term egalitarianism, they have this picture of wanting to make everyone equal in the sense of how much stuff they have. So radical wealth redistribution. Hating, uh, hating merit. That's another good yeah, one. Yeah, like that, that everyone should just kind of be the same in what they in, – in everything that they have. Is that, is that an accurate picture now? Is it – if it isn't, has, it, has that ever been an accurate picture of egalitarianism? Right. So I, I agree with you that that's the popular conception, but uh, I've been doing work now on the history of egalitarianism basically from the mid-17th century forward. And I'm arguing that um, the core ideal of egalitarianism isn't essentially connected with issues of distributive equality of income and wealth, but it's much more fundamentally connected to a critique of social hierarchy. Deep down, what egalitarians oppose is hierarchies based on race, ethnicity, gender, caste, religion, and social hierarchies are fundamentally defined in terms of specific relationships between people the most important one being relations of domination and subjection. So the most important kind of hierarchy that egalitarians oppose is one in which some people get to order other people around and tell them what to do. And usually those hierarchies are based on some background identity difference uh, uh, between the rulers and the ruled. You know, the rulers might be a different caste or a different race Sometimes it's based on wealth, too. Uh, But if you look at the origins of egalitarianism, they didn't oppose inequalities of wealth in and of themselves. What they opposed was a ruling class based on wealth, the idea that you're entitled to rule somebody else just because you own a lot of property. Uh, That was the core idea behind the levelers, and, and that's an idea that's really carried out uh, uh, through the egalitarian tradition, and we can even see some of those concerns uh, in the present day. And of course, the uh, Enlightenment tradition and the founding principles of America, and even part of the French Revolution, had equality as is one of its core aims. Not just liberty, as, as maybe libertarians would like to say, especially coming out of a monarchy and different types of class system that had been the norm for the wor- in the world throughout history. That's quite right. Um, So a lot of Enlightenment thinkers were really, they opposed aristocracy. And what is aristocracy? It's not just that you have a bunch of wealthy landowners, but the landowners are the ruling class in virtue of the fact that they own a lot of property. And that's a very problematic idea. But the Enlightenment in general was not opposed to some people having more money or wealth than others. The question is whether having more wealth entitled entitled those people to rule over other people who had less. You mentioned the levelers. Um, are, they, are they the source of egalitarianism? Are they the first egalitarians or does this idea go back even further? That's a wonderful question. You know, you can find egalitarian ideas going back even to biblical times. Uh, it's... I think a core idea of almost all monotheistic religions, that there is an equality of souls, that one soul doesn't differ from another. Uh, uh, They're all equally eligible for salvation, at least in principle. Uh, The difficulty was with these older biblical forms of egalitarianism was there was always a million reasons why the equality of souls never translated into equality of social relations on earth. You'd only get 
into an egalitarian position in heaven. What's interesting about the 17th century is uh, here you have a movement in the English Civil War, the levelers who really want to bring egalitarian social rela- relations down to earth. Now, you can see some precedents even before the 17th century that start to arise really with the Protestant Reformation. Luther declared the priesthood of all believers. That is, that you didn't need some priest to mediate an individual's relationship to God. At the same time, common people were learning how to read, and they read the Bible for themselves, and they decided, hey, we can interpret the Bible on our own. We don't need the priest to tell us how to understand what the Bible demands. And so, if anything, you can see the origins of more egalitarian thinking arising earlier in the Protestant Reformation with the rise of a variety of egalitarian religious sects, including most notably the Quakers uh, uh, and also some Baptist sects, which um, wanted to reject the hierarchy of priesthood and achieve a much more egalitarian uh, style of worship within the churches. So if you want to go further back, I suppose you could trace egalitarianism to the Reformation, but as far as state relations go and limitations on state power, that's largely arising in the mid-17th century around the time of the English Civil War. And in many ways, the concept of republicanism as was used by founding father figures like Alexander Hamilton really just expressed a lack of social hierarchy to, to a degree and you read a lot of early founder writings and you see them complaining about the opulence of George Washington's carriage, for example, as being a demonstration of not having egalitarian Republican principles, which seems kind of similar to complaining about Catholic ornateness against Protestant austerity, right? Yes, I, I think there's something to that. Although I wouldn't necessarily cite Hamilton uh, as among the founders who were keen on opposing monarchy. Uh, monarchy, yeah, mon- that's a good point. Monarchy. I think he's sort of he's he's a little bit more in egalitarian. The, the real star of the American Revolution, from an egalitarian point of view, is Tom Paine, and Tom Paine really uh, embodied a style of radical egalitarianism that was also quite libertarian. Uh, And that informed radical movements, not just in the United States, but uh, in France and importantly in England. The Chartist movement took a lot of its uh, ideas from Paine. And a lot of those ideas resonate pretty strongly with uh, contemporary libertarian critiques uh, of the state. So far what we've talked about has been mostly this uh, quality of of power distributions um, and an anti-hierarchy view, but there has been—I mean, there has been a, a strain in egalitarianism of um, what what you've called a, a quality of fortune um, or or distribution. And is that when did that come in? What is that, and also when did it come sure, in? Yeah. yeah, right. So um, why don't we go back to the levelers for a moment because. They represent a really interesting kind of movement. The levelers were called the levelers because it, because people accused them of wanting to level all differences in wealth. And they disavowed that completely. In, in fact, they, they argued in favor of free trade um, and private property. They were totally in favor of these institutions. But if you look at the core of what they opposed – they oppose monopoly privileges that were granted by the state. That's the sense in which they were free traders. They saw the state as creating a bunch of cronies by granting monopoly privileges to various manufacturers and merchants that would then shut everybody else out of access to opportunities to set up their own businesses uh, and compete you know, on, on a level playing field with everybody else. So there is a true sense in which they were levelers. They wanted to level down privilege. They wanted um, the state to grant everyone an equal set of rights. And in that sense of leveling down, there's really nothing objectionable to it. It just means getting rid of a class of cronies whose wealth is founded on special monopoly privileges that the state has granted them. 
So you can see in this sense, if you think that the source of property inequality is due to uh, the privileges that a particular class has obtained from the state, uh, libertarians should equally well uh, uh, oppose that kind of inequality and equally call, equally well call for leveling down, or perhaps what you should say is leveling up everybody to equal rights to set up their own business and uh, compete uh, with the people who uh, at the time uh, had been granted monopolies to engage in certain kinds of trade and, and manufacturing. So that's a point at which distribution comes in. But I think it, that concern with distribution, I think, is something that libertarians could sign on to completely. It's only later, really, with the rise of socialism that you get a much more strongly uh, distributionist sense of egalitarianism, which is founded in a critique of uh, the unequal outcomes that free markets uh, deliver. But that that's really a 19th century idea. You look at the 17th and 18th centuries, and egalitarianism is not fundamentally about distribution, except insofar as it's opposed to unequal distributions that are created by uh, state privilege and monopoly. And then industrialization, though, of course, changes – the world a little bit more because if everyone's more or less farming, it doesn't seem like anyone can really shoot ahead of everyone else without having these large factories and industrial industrial things to create that level of wealth. That's exactly right. So if you read somebody like Adam Smith, who I take to be the star of an earlier, fairly moderate kind of egalitarianism, as Smith was not a radical like Tom Paine. Because uh, he hadn't really signed on to a fully Republican program. He was more or less happy with monarchy, although he certainly had his critiques of the ruling class who he thought were were largely either a little bit dull if they were landowners or conspiring against the public if they were manufacturers trying to get their monopoly privileges. <laughs> we can leave that aside. Smith didn't really have a clear uh, alternative to to monarchy in his day. But he did share a lot of the uh, radical Republican sympathy for free markets precisely because the alternative that was on the table at the time was government-granted privilege. And it's one of the reasons why Smith, he opposed monopolies. He opposed uh, 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 also primogenitor, that is, laws that forbade uh, uh, the breakup of estates through inheritance where uh, uh, right all the land would just go to the firstborn son and that would consolidate these huge estates and disinherit all the other second and later born children. He wanted, uh, there were all kinds of other laws in England too that opposed the breakup of large estates and he thought a free market in land would naturally lead to more industrious uh, yeoman farmers uh, they would be more efficient in farming the land. And so you would generally see a breakup of these huge estates because the aristocrats were not very entrepreneurial. They were sort of dullards. Uh, and it'd be better actually if uh, uh, the rules of inheritance were changed to allow the estates uh, to be sold off in pieces and enable more people to lead independent lives of self-employment. And then the uh, the Marxist critique, or I guess socialists even predate Marx a bit, but then they start talking a lot more about wealth or actual holdings, I guess. Right, and and the key thing, as you noted before, that what happened was Smith was writing before the Industrial Revolution, or right at the beginning, and he was actually fairly skeptical that you would need huge, large scale enterprises. Uh, he thought, oh, there would only be a couple occasions where you'd need that, say, for building a canal. Uh, once the Industrial Revolution is well underway uh, in England around the 1830s, you see people starting to worry about the factory system. And here you have huge numbers of people <clears throat> who were formerly self-employed in small workshops uh, now they have been tossed into unemployment because the giant factories are much more efficient producers. 
so they lose their independence and then they have to hire themselves out to the factory owners for poverty level wages. Uh, that's the point at which people start realizing that the older egalitarian vision in which in principle, almost all enterprises would be small scale and consequently, there would be a huge number of opportunities for self-employment. People see that vision isn't really working out as anticipated. The Industrial Revolution means the vast majority of people are going to be wage laborers. They're going to have to be working uh, under the subjection of their employer who orders them around in every little motion minutely for most of their waking lives. Remember, in those days... Uh, the length of the uh, the working day could easily be 12 or 14 hours. And then people start thinking, well, okay, if we can't break up the big factories into small workshops, then we have to find other ways for workers to have fulfilling lives. And there are two main techniques. One of them is to reduce the length of the working day so workers have more hours where they can be you know, under their own recognizance and decide what they do just for themselves without having to take orders from an employer. And secondly, uh, ensuring that they have a decent enough level of income so that they can do something with those free hours other than just barely scraping by the means of subsistence. And that's the point at which a concern for distributive justice in and of itself uh, becomes really prominent, especially in socialist movements, social democracy, and so forth in Europe. And it took longer for that to come over to the United States. But in Europe, it was already very prominent uh, by the mid-19th century. And when did egalitarianism emerge as, I guess, a, a self-consciously like recognized school within political philosophy? Because so far, we've been talking about you know, we talked about Adam Smith, we talked about Karl Marx, but these people didn't see themselves as necessarily part of a, a school that would be called egalitarian. But nowadays yeah. it's a it's a branch of political philosophy. Now that's a great, great question. And in fact, it's highly controversial whether Marx would have thought of himself as an egalitarian. I think not. There's a lot of good scholarship, I think, that shows that Equality wasn't really what he was up to. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so you see, at least intellectually, uh, the late 19th century is a point at which self-conscious egalitarian thinking in the distributive sense starts becoming prominent. Uh, and the reason for this is you have this long 19th century during which all the theories of distributive justice are essentially founded on some notion of class conflict. Um, the older, painite, radical Republicans basically hated the lazy, idle landowners and the government cronies who were living off of tax revenues uh, in these no-show jobs uh, uh, that the state had set up for them. Uh, those were the idlers, and they should be, you know, dispossessed. And Payne, all the way through George, with his single land tax, right, they think the landowners are the parasites of society, and to a certain extent, uh, people living off tax revenue uh, in these no-show jobs. And then you have on the other hand, you have the socialist tradition coming out of Marx, who sees capitalists as the exploiters, the coupon clippers. They're not doing any work. The workers are doing everything. Um, so you see a little shift, but it's still a very class conflict point of view. And even the laissez-faire capitalists, uh, people like Spencer and Sumner, uh, they explicitly... Uh, endorsed class warfare and they said, look, it's the capitalists versus the workers and, you know, whatever pops out of that conflict uh, is going to be the just distribution. By the late 19th century, people are coming to realize that that way of understanding distribution is really problematic. A main reason is that obviously you can't get 
any kind of consensus. So the late 19th century, you see theorists trying to come up with ideas of distributive justice that could, in principle, be inclusive of everyone's interests. Um, uh, in the United States, you can even look around World War I, you see these ideas being formed. In England, it's a bit earlier, uh, a late 19th century picture. People are striving for a notion of equality that will be inclusive of, of all classes. But distributive justice in its contemporary formulation with clear principles of distributive justice is mostly starting to happen around World War II. Uh, you see, for instance, the famous beverage report uh, uh, articulating the principles of a welfare state and comprehensive s uh, social insurance uh, in Britain. Uh, before then, you actually had Bismarck and his plans for social insurance. Uh, uh, that was already in the late 19th century. And Bismarck basically was trying to figure out a way to make capitalism acceptable to the workers and to to dislodge the popularity of the socialist movement by showing that capitalism could deliver real benefits to the workers. And that's why Bismarck, the arch reactionary anti-socialist, was in fact the author of Germany's uh, welfare state. It seems like you start having a conversation about uh, dessert, obviously, what do you deserve uh, and responsibility too to some extent, uh, workers versus capitalists or underclass versus versus rich people and whether or not people are getting what they deserve and what they're responsible for. Yeah, if anything, I see dessert-based notions of distributive justice are much more where the 19th century class conflict view was coming from, right? That The labor theory of value is based on a theory of productive contribution. You, mm -hmm. you should get in accordance with what you contribute. But the labor theory of value said workers were the only people who are contributing at anything. <laughs> right? So the workers should get 100% of the product. Now, yeah, Marx you... himself had a problem with that, and he criticized that view. But that was a very popular view among what you could call popular Marxism, if not Marx himself. Yeah, the harder you work, the more blisters you have. The, yeah, the more sweat on your brow, the more you deserve. Quite right. Uh, and it's really later on, starting with ideas of social insurance, you see both the social democrats and people like Bismarck. People get the idea that, look, uh, a lot of times – People can be prone to illness and industrial accidents and unemployment. It's not no fault of their own. You have a recession and millions of people are thrown out of work. It's not because of anything wrong that they did. But now they no longer have an income. It's not their fault. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, instead of dessert as productive contribution, you get the notion of well, this suffering is not deserved because it wasn't their fault. Uh, and that can be a rationale for social insurance that you could see that people are prone to systematic risks of illness, disability, unemployment, and so forth. And the workers who get together pay into a fund uh, uh, managed by the state or sometimes by uh, private entities so that if this risk befalls them, uh, they'll have something to uh, fall back on and will not uh, suffer destitution as a result of some undeserved bad luck. You've been talking a lot about political and social movements and, and views of egalitarianism within those. Within the academy at this time, was, were, I mean, were philosophy professors kind of mirroring what you're describing on the outside world or – were they going off in different directions? Yeah, I mean, the academics too, uh, already by the late 19th century, as I say, people are trying to move towards a vision of distributive justice that isn't just going to be based on class conflict, but something that could unite all classes of society around a common vision. So you see in England, people like uh, uh, Tawney 
or in the United States, Ralph Barton Perry, famous philosopher around World War I, they're kind of groping towards this. But you don't see really uh, sharp analytical accounts of distributive justice uh, until the post-World War II era. And of course, in the United States, uh, really difficult thinking about distributive justice uh, was largely propelled by John Rawls's uh, theory of justice, where he puts distributive justice back on to into academic discourse in a major way uh, by articulating and defending egalitarian principles of distribution. And it seems like he kind of has a responsibility theory or maybe in the – what you call luck egalitarianism of – the things that are not your fault such as your natural intelligence or natural speed or maybe your birth parents should not factor heavily into your placement in society? Ah, so yeah, there's a cup there's a number of different ideas that are that are connected here. Many people have thought that Rawls is what what is known as a lucky egalitarian who says that nobody should be less well off than anybody else because of uh uh bad luck or factors that are not their responsibility. I actually think that's a deep misreading of what Rawls is up to. Uh, Rawls, in fact, uh, was ready to tolerate uh, quite a lot of inequality in the distribution of income and wealth that could be traced to things like the genetic lottery, that some people are just born with, uh, with, talents that are highly valued by the market and other people are born with uh, genetic endowments that are not highly valued by the market. The, Rawls actually did not have a fundamental objection to the fact that inequalities generated by an efficient market-based system would reward some people with some genes rather than others, even though they didn't deserve, obviously nobody deserves the genes that they were born with. That's pure luck. Um, Rawls' more fundamental uh, kind of egalitarianism is based rather on uh, a certain conception of how the rules of the market game should be designed. It's about the rules of the game and not about the outcomes. Okay, so his idea is you should design the rules of the economic game, the rules of property and contract and regulation and so forth and taxation in such a way that um, <clears throat> those rules will ensure that inequalities that, that help the better off will also help the worst off in society. What you want is inequalities to be to the advantage of everyone. So Rawls's fundamental idea is, look, he's going to tolerate inequality, but he wants to make sure that inequality is serving everybody's interests and not just the interests of the people at the top. This is what he called the difference principle. Uh, and there's a lot of inequalities of that sort, right? Some people have much nicer jobs that involve a lot of intellectual thinking and discretion and freedom of judgment and responsibility. Those things are generally enjoyable features of the job. But if you're going to be a doctor, uh, you need a lot of discretion and a lot of uh, opportunities for intellectual labor. It's not a good use of a doctor's time uh, to have her scrubbing toilets or something. She, everyone benefits if she can devote her energies uh, at work uh, towards uh, serving patients. And the, the poor also benefit uh, from the fact that her professional life is relatively cushy in the sense that it's insulated from dreary, drudgy, uh, uh, burdensome labor. But in fact, it's pretty interesting work. Uh, but hey, otherwise you wouldn't have enough doctors. It'd be way more expensive to help the sick uh, uh, get better. I wanted to talk about luck egalitarianism because you have – you've raised some really interesting criticisms of it in some of your writing. But before before we turn to that, I wanted to see if you could give us a sense of uh, 
what egalitarianism broadly looks like now. I mean one of the things that Trevor and I have talked about in past episodes of Free Thoughts is the idea that libertarianism is not one philosophy but it's a it's a group of different views that share some traits in common but also have meaningful differences between them. And egalitarianism is is the same way. There are different kinds of egalitarians who can disagree with each other about very fundamental issues. So I was wondering if you could give us kind of a, the bird's eye view of what some of these different sorts of egalitarianism are, the the big ones today, and how they differ from each other. Yeah. So I broadly divide egalitarianism into two groups of theories. One I call luck egalitarianism, and that's based on the view that nobody should have less than anybody else uh, uh, due to factors that they're not responsible for or that they don't deserve. Okay. So if somebody's worse off than somebody else due to sheer luck, that's considered unjust according to luck egalitarians. And then they derive a whole bunch of other uh, ideas about distributive justice from that fundamental idea that inequalities due to pure luck should be eliminated. Uh, the other group of theories I call uh, relational egalitarianism because what they're most interested in is not the distribution of income and wealth and other goods in and of themselves, but rather how people relate to each other in society. Uh, so, According to a relational egalitarian, the fundamental egalitarian objective is basically to eliminate oppressive social hierarchy, relations of domination and subjection, relations of stigmatization where some people uh, are despised or degraded because of their social identity you know, their race or their sexual orientation or things like that. Um, <clears throat> and also social relations in which some people basically just don't count in the eyes of others, say relations in which the state is organized in such a way that whole groups of people and their interests just don't figure into the state's uh, calculations of, how to uh, formulate public policy. Uh, so those three sorts of hierarchy, hierarchies of domination and subjection, hierarchies of honor and stigmatization, and hierarchies of high and low standing uh, uh, in the eyes and calculation of others, uh, those are the three kinds of social hierarchies that relational egalitarians oppose, and they want to replace those social relations with social relations of equality where, you know, people recognize that they have to interact with others on terms of mutual respect and regard for their interests and can't go around uh, uh, just despising them because of their social identity and treating them as outcasts on that account. Uh, and that second relational uh, form of egalitarianism is what I've been trying to promote. I'm arguing that you can trace this all the way back to the earliest days of egalitarianism uh, with uh, the levelers, uh, and that this form of egalitarianism also, um, uh, it can accept uh, a variety of, of modes of inequality in the distribution of income and wealth, although on this view, there will be some inequalities in income and wealth that will be uh, too extreme to be acceptable. Then before we get into exploring those, exploring what sorts of um, inequalities are acceptable and what's not and why and what we ought to do about it, um, you're on, – on the topic of luck egalitarianism, you're pretty down on luck egalitarianism. Um, and so – In a way that, that – Many, I think, libertarians would would appreciate your critiques of uh, what they generally think of luck egalitarianism. Right, and so I was. Wondering, could you tell us what's what's wrong with luck egalitarianism? Sure. 
Well, um, <clears throat> there's a lot of problems I have with lucky egalitarianism. Um, they, uh, for one thing, lucky egalitarians, I think just foundationally, they have not articulated uh, any realistic sense of what could possibly be an injustice. So on, on my view, for something to count as an injustice, you have to identify somebody who is uh, suffering something uh, that they're entitled to complain about. And you have to identify somebody else to whom they can address that complaint who is uh, responsible for it. Which is um, actually a view that, that Friedrich Hayek actually also expressed about justice. You, quite you, right. you have to identify a, a person, not just a, a volcano or something impersonal like that. That's exactly right. And uh, my problem with it, is that if somebody's born with less talent, say, than somebody else, number one, I fundamentally don't think that that is in itself anything to complain about. Uh, it's nobody's fault here. We're assuming that, you know, the person wasn't subject to, uh, you know, like the mom when she was pregnant with this person wasn't maliciously uh, drugged with something that caused a genetic mutation. We'll set aside those kind of perverted cases. In the normal case, if somebody's born with less talent than, than somebody else, it's just a matter of luck. There's nobody to blame for it. But at the same time, I also think that it's kind of perverse to uh, direct one's anger or complaints against the more talented. Uh, in a well-ordered society... Uh, the more talented, the exercise of the talents of the more talented should redound to the benefit of everyone, right? We all enjoy watching the superb athletes uh, do their great performances in the sports they engage in. Most of us, of course, will never be that athletically talented, similar for musical talent or any kind of uh, artistic talent and also various productive and entrepreneurial talents, uh, when society is running well, the more talented, when they exercise their talents, are actually doing stuff uh, that redounds to everyone's advantage. And so if one has less talent, one should feel happy that other people have talents uh, uh, that are helping them. I so I don't think that kind, you know, and, and the lucky egalitarianism, I think, inspires a kind of unjust envy towards the more talented uh, and we should discourage that uh, that sense of grievance against the more talented. It also seems to, as you write, uh, have something more like pity uh, rather than compassion. In, in one line in your essay, which we'll put a link up to in the show notes, uh, you say, compassion and pity can both move a person to act benevolently, but only pity is condescending. Quite right, right. And so the other the other side of the complaint is that lucky egalitarianism not only inspires envy against the more talented, but also a kind of condescending pity towards the less talented. Right? Oh, it's because they're so pathetic mm -hmm. that we have to give them more to make up for their innate deficiencies. I think that is also a very inegalitarian thought. Uh, it's obnoxious and offensive and people should not want to uh, claim resources on the basis of their inferiority to others. I, that was one of the things I really liked about your critique of luck, of luck egalitarianism was this, this sense that it's at a very deep level is simply disrespectful and not, not respectful of human dignity. Yeah, yeah that's but right. Yeah, and, the, and you bring it up in a variety of ways, uh, saying that uh, putting yourself on an obligation, things that a lot of conservatives it would resonate with conservatives, which uh, probably would might maybe strike people as odd. But uh, there's something about these these laws that are insulting, uh, both to the people administering them and the people they're being administered to. I think that's right. Now, I do want to stress, though, that both kinds of egalitarianism that exists today, both the relational egalitarians and the lucky egalitarians are willing to accept quite a lot of distributive inequality. 
I've already explained how Rawls accepts inequalities that, as a matter of fact, redound to the advantage of everyone. But lucky egalitarians, too, are perfectly happy to accept inequalities that really are due to, uh, say, somebody working harder than another person or more prudently managing uh, their assets. They're perfectly happy to allow that. Or even people, people being being misfortune for their own fault sometimes. Right, through yeah. their own fault. So lucky egalitarians are perfectly happy to say that, you know, if you screwed up and it's your fault – that there's no injustice in your being less well off than somebody who behaved uh, more industriously and and more prudently. So you, you don't really see it's a very rare today to see somebody who is trying to advance a really radical distributive equality that rejects any inequalities in the distribution of income and wealth. I can't actually think of anybody right now who's who, who is that extreme in, in either egalitarian camp. On the relational egalitarianism, as you've described it, a lot of it seems to be stuff that libertarians could get behind. I mean we could say like people should be equal in, in their rights. Um, they should be equal in treatment before the law and, and that sounds great. So I'm wondering where does relational egalitarianism as you advocate – Apart from libertarians, what are we going to disagree with as far as your vision for for egalitarian justice? Right. So um, here's one place uh, where I think libertarians and relational egalitarians uh, might part ways. Uh, relational egalitarians do see a pretty strong rationale both for a ceiling. Uh, or, I'm sorry, a floor below which people shouldn't fall. So, you know, we believe in safety nets uh, and also see some rationales for limiting extreme accumulations at the top. Uh, and why don't I focus on the top? Because I think people are more familiar with the idea of safety nets. Uh, but relational egalitarians are are pretty worried about, say, the contemporary distribution of wealth in the United States with uh, more and more wealth accumulating to people at the top. The fundamental reason for that is is political. Uh, it's that the more extreme the wealth inequality, the more likely you're going to end up with a plutocracy where the rich are calling all the shots uh, uh, in government. And I, I think we see some evidence for that. So if if you want equality of standing in the sense that the state should treat everyone's interests as on a par and not just curry favor with some privileged group, uh, then the current dependence of people in Congress on having to spend about 60 or 70 percent of their time fundraising from rich people uh, and having to offer attention and agenda setting power in return for that. Uh, is very problematic. But, so the prime objection to extreme inequalities of wealth is not that some people just get to be really rich, but rather that that wealth gets translated into unequal political power until the rich just capture the political process. You don't have a democracy anymore. But that, that seems like a concern that a lot of libertarians are actually on board with. I mean when we rail against, say, cronyism, um, it's it's that – People who are politically connected and people who are wealthy can bend the government to their will to get special favors that the rest of us can't. But the the libertarian solution to that is simply to reduce the the size of government and the scope of its powers to the level that no one can kind of get it to call shots in their favor. That that the government, if it's limited to simply protecting rights, say, then no matter how much money you have, you're not going to be able to get it to give you favors because it doesn't have any favors to give. Right. And, and so, yeah, and here's the rejoinder from relational egalitarians is that uh, contemporary capitalist systems actually depend on a very complicated infrastructure of property rights. Uh, these are the constitutive rules of the game for how capitalism is supposed to run. And it turns out that 
as technology and the scale of production get larger and larger, you need more and more complicated rules. <laughs> Things like intellectual property, for instance, uh, they can get pretty arcane. And uh, the difficulty is, I think most people acknowledge that some form or other of intellectual property is going to be needed to stimulate innovation. But at the same time, intellectual property is a state grant of monopoly rights, at least for a temporary period. So here we have a problem because you could see how you could game the system of intellectual property rights in order to shore up massive monopoly power. But it's but you can't say we're not going to have the state engaged in acknowledging or creating uh, uh, intellectual property rights. I don't know. Maybe some libertarians think that. There actually are a lot of libertarians who think that and for exactly the reasons you said, one of the reasons uh, – first one being that they don't think it's really property in the sense of it's not rivalrous. I don't take anything from you by taking an idea from you. And then the other sense of it's just constantly political gamesmanship for an intellectual monopoly established by the state and almost the same thing going back to the levelers and saying it's just as good as a king's monopoly over over shipping to the East India Company. Right. And, cre and that happened, of course, with the Mickey Mouse Protection Act of 1998 when the Sonny Bono Copyright Act is what it's actually called. When, when Disney was complaining about the fact that Mickey Mouse was about to go into the public domain and that was one of the biggest reasons they ex extended that. Right. So, you know, I think it would be an interesting uh, experiment to see whether we could come up with some alternative method for encouraging innovation. Um, you know, I, I'm sort of of two minds of this. My own personal view is that copyright is completely outrageous and beyond the pale and that uh, the term of copyrights, if you allow it at all, should be radically reduced from what they currently are. Mm -hmm. uh, and the evidence for this is that as we can see from the explosion of information on the web, it looks as if people are perfectly willing to share their ideas with each other for free. They just want to be read. I mean, yeah, creative <laughs> look at Commons. Wikipedia. It's yeah. very impressive, actually, how many people just just want to communicate ideas to others and they're not asking for any money for it or or perhaps only a voluntary contribution. Mm -hmm. well, On the other hand, with patents, I, I have some worries that there are certain kinds of invention that requires spectacular amounts of upfront in, uh, investment. And if other people could just kind of seize the results, uh, say for pharmaceuticals, uh, it's not to say I, I'm not a great fan of big pharma, but hey, it really is objectively expensive to develop mm. effective new drugs. And it's hard to see how that could happen if, Without if patents. as soon as you invent it, other people can start manufacturing because the marginal cost of manufacturing a pill is almost nothing. It, all the cost is in development. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll probably – we'll definitely have some intellectual property episodes in the future um, probably on both sides. It's a debate within libertarianism. I wanted to go back a little bit though when you were talking about political influence. I think this really gets to a, a core of relational egalitarianism that it's not just uh, – wealth that's a problematic. Steve Jobs brought us a bunch of awesome things but if Steve Jobs starts courting government power, it's different. But one of the things that's interesting in your work is when you're talking about egalitarianism, you sort of have to start talking about uh, who and what what traits should get equal access or should create equality. What, what things should we be maximizing equality on? And if you remove money from the political process, it's not the case that representatives would therefore then treat all of their constituents the same or even more interestingly, it doesn't even seem to be the case that the representatives should treat all of their constituents the same and not prioritize certain people in their districts over other people, not just like anyone who calls, I will give you as much as say about public policy as anyone else. Well, you know, it is true that given that we have uh, – that all modern democracies are based on uh, – competition among political parties and parties themselves are organized around various constituencies um, and ideologies that you can't expect any given representative uh, to treat absolutely everyone equally. So uh, given the realities of modern democracy, uh, the best you can hope for is not each individual representative treating every constituent exactly equally, 
but that the interplay of competing parties will bring about uh, a rough parity. Uh, but do you think globally. do you think it should be a pair? I mean, that's the question of like uh, in that. Some, I think about this as some things might make it unequal, which goes back to the core question: wealth. Other people might have inequalities, such as the ability to be well spoken or the, uh -huh. the ability to have uh, create political coalitions and have a lot of friends and oh, ra yeah. rally uh -huh. people, and that would be an, like an inequality in some sense. That guy's super charismatic and he gets people behind him, so he gets more of the ear of the legislator than someone who is not charismatic and can't rally people behind him. So you could have egalitarian concerns about that. Oh, I see. Yeah, so yeah, I'm not so much concerned about that because they're purely individual. So it is true that the smooth talkers and the better lookers are liable to have an advantage in electoral politics, uh, you know, in the age of mass media and so forth. I, I, that doesn't worry me so much. Um, yeah, that's just another way in which unequal talents uh, tend to uh, uh, give people unequal advantages in competing for certain kinds of jobs. What I more and more worry about is uh, – once the person is in office, uh, how are they treating everybody else? And here I acknowledge that, you know, any given politician is is uh, not going to be strictly impartial among all constituents because they're representatives of political parties that are coalitions of different groups of constituents. But that in the aggregate, uh, in a well-run democracy, uh, the play of inter interest group politics uh, should, in the aggregate, uh, work in such a way that everyone gets adequate representation of their interests, uh, uh, you know, in in a representative democracy. In this democratic equality, as you've referred to it, you talk about a need for for equality of capabilities. That we should make sure that everyone is as capable of participating as everyone else. We've talked about this just now in the in the political sphere of you know political influence. But you also say that this – we need this equality of capabilities within civil society as well. What, what do you mean by that? Right. So remember, I don't think that uh, – I'm not advocating literal exact mathematical equality of capabilities uh, because that's really impossible. There will be some people who uh, uh, will be – more highly educated than others, partly just because they have a taste for studiousness, <laughs> right? They study hard. They learn a lot more. They're really interested in, in, in academic learning. So they'll move further in the educational system. But you, but I do think any egalitarian society is interested in ensuring that everybody has access to a decent education at the primary and secondary levels and has a reasonable shot, uh, given their opportunities for primary and secondary education, that if they work hard and are studious, that they have a reasonable shot at uh, a college education too. Uh, that they that you know that their K through twelve education is not so deficient that they could never qualify themselves for higher education. I think that's unjust. Uh, you know, the state should provide decent opportunities. Uh, for everyone, but it doesn't follow that they would be that the outcomes would be equal, uh, nor even necessarily that um, every single public school, say, would offer exactly the same opportunities as every other. I, I think that's both impossible and probably unjust because different communities have different tastes for education too. Some people, some communities would rather spend their money uh, uh, on other things. And that, that's not inherently unjust as long as every kid gets a shot at, at uh, decent education so they have the capabilities they need uh, both to function successfully uh, in the economy and to function effectively as citizens. In, in the essay, in your essay, What is the Point of Quality? Um, I guess one of the things that you, you say that egalitarianism demands 
for each of us is, quote, the social conditions of being accepted by others, such as the ability to appear in public without shame and not being ascribed outcast status. And I was curious about that when I read it because I was wondering, is that – it seems to me like there are – we could say you know, for, for races, it's, it's not OK to shame or ascribe outcast status to people on the basis of race or sexual orientation. But does that extend even to say cultural attitudes or beliefs or behaviors? Because it seems there can be you know, beliefs that one holds that might, in, might make it so that one – deserves outcast status if you are a you know just virulent bigot um, yeah. or a member of the KKK or you know hold there, there can be views that are just really repugnant the and, Phelps church right yeah. and so and yeah. you should and so you absolutely ought to be shamed when you're in public right yeah well the Phelps church has uh, almost uniquely among political actors in contemporary America figured out a way to be equally offensive to all groups, right or left. <laughs> That's an achievement in and of itself, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it takes hard work to do that. Um, so, yeah, you know, we, we do live in a free society, freedom of speech. And so the freedom to speak your mind uh, is very, very important. But, of course, it doesn't mean that you that you are thereby entitled to be insulated from harsh criticism uh, and uh, rejection by people who hate your views. So in that sense, right, if, if, if we're talking about pure ideological disagreement, uh, we can hardly uh, ask people to uh, restrain their denunciation of views that they find uh, Appalling. I mean, that's all part of a free society, and it could be that, right? Some some groups then, on the basis of their uh, ideology, uh, will not fare well. But at the same time, remember, this is just a cultural matter. It's it's a matter of civil society. It's not the state's business to go around enforcing real outcast status, even on the Phelps. Right? They're entitled to freedom of speech and all the legal rights that everyone else has. Uh, but then in civil society, that is, ex, you know, not not in the legal or the state sense, but just in terms of their day to day interactions with other people, uh, you know, other people despise them and don't want to have anything to do with them. Well, they have a right to despise them. Mm. So uh, we're almost out of time. But um, as a final question, Aaron and I had, have talked about this uh, for a long time, but the, the question about uh, – the efficacy of the state being a consideration for political philosophy. So you could have one situation. This is something libertarians take very seriously. You could say that what should the state do is the first question and then what can the state do is the second question. And generally political philosophers sort of sit in the should realm and we've talked today about egalitarianism and a, a theory of it and different theories of it that say the state should be doing this. But if the state is unable to do certain things, if it if it can't do it, and if ought implies can, which might be something you disagree with, then could that ever change the should? Could the fact that the state is unable to do something effectively mean that we shouldn't even be saying that the state should be doing it in the first place? Or Aaron or, maybe put, or put it a different way. Not just that the state might not be capable of of executing the mission that's been given to it, but that it might be able to do it, but granting it the the amount of power that it would take to carry out that mission carries huge risks as far as the state could then use that power and it, I mean if history serves, in many cases will use that power to do really awful things to us. Trevor Or even in the education sense too of just – I completely agree uh, in the principle that I would love – I want to live in a world where people have the best opportunity to succeed. Uh, but I don't think that state education does that, uh, and and so we can we share that principle, but it's different efficacy, different use of uh, the tools that we're going to use for that. Right. Certainly, on the principle ground, I entirely agree with you that auto applies can. So if the state can't do something, then you shouldn't give the job to the state to do it. I I agree entirely with that. And of course, it's an empirical question what the state is capable uh, of doing or not, uh, and it's also worth vigorously exploring uh, alternatives to uh, state provision and seeing what other sorts of institutions uh, can solve the, the problems that we face.
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, unfortunately, a lot of times the state it sometimes keeps people from thinking about those other possibilities, which is uh, because they think they have something in front of them, but maybe uh, there are better possibilities outside of it. Yeah. For libertarians who are listening to this and aren't – I mean we're not ready to get on board with egalitarianism, what, what do you think – what should we still take away from this? What do you think is even without abandoning libertarianism, what can we learn from egalitarianism? Well, I think if you if you look at the relational egalitarian tradition, I think libertarians would see a lot to like. Libertarians and relational egalitarians are united in their suspicion of some people wanting to boss other people around. And and that's where we really have a lot of common ground. Then the question is what kinds of social practices and institutions do we have to construct in order to minimize that bossing around? Thank you very much for coming on Free Thought, Professor Anderson. Ah, it's a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for listening to Free Thoughts. If you have any questions or comments about today's show, you can find us on Twitter at Free Thoughts Pod. That's Free Thoughts P O D. Free Thoughts is a project of libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute and is produced by Evan Banks. To learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.